Hello and welcome to Let Me Bore You to Sleep. My name is Jason Newland. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. And I'm going to give another attempt at reading a bit of the stuff out of my bird book. In my last recording, which I think was yesterday, I don't think I got very far, which is not unusual for me. But I thought what I would do is go through some of the different birds and give you a visual description of them. Before I do that, let's give you an update on today. No, I didn't do much. That's it really. I didn't do much. Um, what I'm in the process of doing is transcribing my recordings and my intention is to transcribe all of them which is going to take a while as I've got over a thousand recordings and growing by probably 10, 10 plus a week. Yeah, I probably do over 10 recordings a week, maybe more, sometimes more, sometimes 15. So, yeah, probably, yeah, probably on a busy, well, busy week, but on a, on a good week, I'll do probably three a day. But normally I do at least two a day, maybe the odd three, so it's about 15, between 15 and 20. So it's not just a case of transcribing the old recordings, I'm also going to be transcribing the newer ones eventually. So I've transcribed, but why transcribe? There's two, there's two aspects to the process that I'm doing. I found somewhere that I can transcribe the podcast into text, and it's not perfect, but it's pretty good though. So I'm, once I've done that, and that takes a fair while to do, because it's done online, and then I use another website to actually listen to the recording. So I paste in the text that was transcribed automatically, and then I edit it whilst listening to the recording which means and I have it on slow I know that I don't talk particularly quickly however when it comes to editing and changing words and making new sentences and I need it to be a little bit slower so it's probably about maybe half the speed of how I'm talking now. Which means a one hour recording, which is about average for these, let me bore you to sleep sessions, would take about two hours each plus another maybe 20 minutes to do the automatic 
uh, transcribing. So it's a fairly uh, laborious process. Yet I am determined to do it because I intend to write some books based on the things that I've talked about. Maybe not so much these ones because I do talk a lot of silly stuff. So I'm not going to have a book that says and then I turned left and I walked past a lamppost which I've seen at least 300 times and you know although I might I'm thinking of thinking of doing a, a let me bore you to sleep book with stories that are just really really boring so I might take some ideas from over 200 recordings so far so there might be a few bits that I could take and use because and I don't know why but I seem to function more smoothly like with my brain uh, thinking creatively when I'm talking when I'm making a recording as opposed to sitting in front of a, a pad of blank paper holding a pen for some reason this process seems to be more flowy for me and stuff just seems to come because for some reason never never ever run our things to say which is not necessarily a superpower in normal life but when it comes to talking for an hour about stuff it seems to be a particular skill set which seems to be useful for this thing that I'm doing. It's a functional skill, which is, in other circumstances, probably dysfunctional. Because I have found that whence talking to another human at some point during a conversation they seem to wish to talk themselves and I don't really like being interrupted when I'm in a flow and I realise I realised a long time ago that not many people want to just stand there and listen to me talking about myself for long periods of time. You know, it can... I'm not saying that I've ruined weddings, but... Although... I think it's, I don't know, you know what they say, there's an old saying, isn't there, talk about what you know about, I know about me, 
so I can't talk about other people because I don't know them uh, I can gossip but it's just a lot of gossip is just made up boring stuff isn't it and the only people that gossip are people that are bored so and I'm, I don't get bored with myself very often because I'm so exciting I'm such a <laughs> it's a never ending it's like do you remember when you was a kid or if you've got children you might go to these places and then like these fun activity centres and there's a a ball pit with lots of coloured balls and you can jump into it and probably catch all kinds of weird illnesses from other kids but that's what I am I just I kind of it's always or just the activity centre itself there's always something to play with there's always uh, you know if I go on the, the bars the monkey bars or climb up the net or you know it's always something that kind of interests me within my brain I had a friend years ago that said to me that I just seem to amuse myself more than anyone else could that I, I find my own thoughts more interesting than other people's what other people say which is not my fault it's not always the case that I've, oh yeah I was watching on telly um, Chappelle what is something Chappelle he's a stand up comedian and he's got a a new uh, a stand up show on Netflix very funny very funny but yeah so so that's the secret with being the most boring person on the planet is talking about stuff that I find really interesting which everyone else finds boring or maybe my description of it might be considered mildly mildly Calming and sedentary is that a, is that a word? Sedentary, kind of sedating, quite of a. I'm like a little sleeping tablet, but but I'm not. The good thing with me is you don't need to take drugs. Just listen to me. No prescription needed. I can just soften soften your mind so it's ready to just drift off to sleep and even for people that aren't listening to this to go to sleep and it's just for a, a bit of company that's nice as well I can just wrap it on about stuff and I imagine if I was kind of, you know, getting paid to do this on a radio show, I'd probably have to come up with some kind of material <laughs> and some more um, interesting conversations to talk about, but then it wouldn't be a boring, boring to sleep session, would it? I'm guessing you could never have this on a radio because in case people listen to it whilst they were driving and you couldn't continuously keep saying please only listen when you can safely close your eyes in between each sentence so although I would quite like to do a radio show just a chilled out 
No, not necessarily a talk show like where people phone in. Although I could do that, but well, I don't know if I could. I've not done it, but I'm sure I could. Um, but I don't know if I'd want to do some a, a radio show where there was music. Although I could could quite like that, but I'd probably be listening to the music and thinking, but I want to talk got to wait for three minutes before I can talk again. What am I going to talk about in three minutes? And then I'll only be able to talk for two minutes and then there'll be another song. So, you know, would I be able to fit everything in? Would it all fit into the gap that's available? That's the question. So, I'd quite like, because my era error for music is pretty much like 80s and 90s in a sense of I was 10 in 1980 so I became a bit more uh, interested in music a bit more aware of the charts and you know stuff like that although I was before that age but I'm just giving 10 as an idea like a a marker and then the 90s that started and I was 20 in 1990 so during my 20s again you know, I was actually a DJ for four years at the in the nineties. So I was very, you know, I was very aware of the music of the nineties, and I, I had jobs where the radio was playing all the time. But then I was also very aware of the sixties and some of the fifties because of my dad being growing up in the 60s and he liked to play other uh, Beatles and you know the 60s songs and even the 50s songs because he was born in what about 1945 or 47 and yeah 45 something like that so he would have been the late 50s he'd have been 10 years old 55 let's say so he'd have been listening to Rubber Ball and uh, what other ones Rock Around the Clock and other such songs which was the beginning really of the rock and roll you know before well Elvis was 1957 but the Beatles was what 1962 or 1963 so, yeah, so I'm kind of aware of those songs. Then the 70s, I was born in 1970. I have a recollection of some of the songs that I listened to when I was proper little. Um, I became a bit more aware of the songs in the late 70s. And yeah, so like maybe 77 onwards, I had the Grease album and ABBA and uh, the Bee Gees, I think Boney M. So yeah, I kind of got to know the 70s as well. And there's been times, probably after 2001, when I hadn't listened to the radio or listened to any new songs for months at a time due to just working all the time and uh, not listening to the radio.
then I go through periods when I do watch uh, like a video channel where there's lots of music on there and I, I get really up to date with what's what's going on what songs are popular and everything but I'm not as up to date as I used to be I do try and keep up to date because I have this this little fear this little fear that one day I'm going to say uh, something as ridiculous as oh, there hasn't been a decent song uh, released since 1999 or something like that and I'd never want to be like that I've, I've known people like that you know there's always no not a decent song since 1960s like really nothing decent since the 80s really I've heard some songs from the 80s that I forgot about I watched uh, Top of the Pops from I think it was 1987 and I watched it and there was some stuff on there that was really bad I mean really 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 bad and I seem to think of the 80s in a kind of a nostalgic way I think of like some of the great songs like Duran Duran, Adam and the Ants, Madness, uh, Madonna, Whitney Houston, Prince, Michael Jackson, uh, Wham. The list is really, really long. And there's so many great songs that I remember. But there were some really, really awful ones. Like really, um, the amount of attempts by some singers or bands to try and be like the Beastie Boys or Run DMC that really didn't didn't cut the mustard. I would, is a description I would say, and listening back to them. And they were in the top 40. And then they disappeared. And. Yeah. It's it's kind of weird. to hit. It's like oh. But then sometimes. I'll watch Top of the Pops. Because they, they show it quite often. Different years. Because it used to be on. It's a music television program. Which was on for. About 30 years. Um, and that's a long show there wasn't even any breaks it was on BBC One so um, the occasionally I watch it and there'll be a singer or an act that I'd forgotten about with a song that I'd forgotten about which I used to absolutely love absolutely love and it feels so good just it's, it's a lovely experience um, I think one of those songs was um, what was it going it, was the, it starts off he's a small town boy living in a restless world on and 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 I used to love that song but I forgot about it and then it was in The Sopranos in the the, the last episode of The Sopranos in 2000 and I suppose 2004 around that time maybe 2005 when The Sopranos ended and I fell in love with it again And I was just like, wow, how did I forget about this song? And I had a whole new emotional connection to it because it was connected to one of my favourite programmes of all time, which was The Sopranos. I loved that programme. And it's... Is it Chicago, I think? That, right? Yeah, Chicago. Um that's the band and it's like oh 
so that was good. And then when I was a DJ, I used to play songs from not so much in the 60s because that used to upset my boss, but from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. By 90s, because I'd finished, you know, I wasn't doing it in the 2000s, but I learned just by doing doing it every single song that was loved by people that wanted to dance. So basically any disco song I got to learn which ones. Uh, so it ranged from ABBA. So it had stuff in the 70s. I didn't really dip into the 60s very often. Um, Shout by Lulu was fairly popular but um, but I think she did re-release that in the 80s I think but ABBA Dancing Queen Come On Eileen that was quite a good one to end end on um, mind you I remember playing it once and there was this bit of a ruckus and uh, this woman there was like a table near the DJ booth I think they're nurses no, that's not really relevant but I started playing this song and she just stood up and ran out of the club she like picked up her purse or handbag and a coat and binoculars for some reason she had binoculars and she ran out and I said what's, what's up with her she said she's called Eileen so oh okay Apparently she didn't enjoy that song. And what other songs was there? Wham. Do 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 do. What is it? Wake me up before you go go. And uh, so I wonder if that would have been so popular if it had been called Wake Me Up Before You Go. But calling it Wake Me Up Before You Go Go. Or what was it called Wake Me Up Before You Go Go? It might have just been called Wake Me Up. I'm sure it's called Wake Me Up Before You Go Go. So what other songs? I think Bee Gees. Some of that like uh, the... Because they kind of, not so much invented disco, but they were kind of credited for the disco genre with Saturday Night Live and dressing up in the the stuff they dressed up in and John Travolta uh, wearing his white suit and what came first was it Saturday Night Live or was it Grease because both of them were huge films and both of them had like huge albums that came from it because I don't think Saturday Night Live was all just the Bee Gees. I'm sure other people sung on it as well. But I don't think John Travolta sung on that. But he, of course, sung on the uh, Grease album. Because I remember my brother, my older brother, buying the Grease album. And this is while we were still living in the house that my nan and granddad ended up moving in. And there was, and my little brother was born in, not in the house, but uh, he was born whilst living, whilst we were living in the house. And my older brother, not the oldest one, but the one just below, he 
release album and it was a double album and I just remember it because he, he opened it up it might have even looked like three sleeves I don't forget I don't remember but it had all these like, cartoons on it which I guess was the at the beginning of the film I think it also had the lyrics to the songs as well and it was an actual album you know a, a vinyl album because uh, CDs were not uh, invented at that time so yeah when I was a DJ I had lots of uh, I kind of got a lot of knowledge in disco songs like you know as far as how to put it I probably at the time I would have made a really good wedding DJ but now I'll, I'd have to update it and add you know it's 20 years worth of nearly 18 years worth of songs that have been really popular over the years that I'd need to add but things like Dancing Queen as far as I'm aware would still be popular but I don't know I imagine the film Mamma Mia gave a big resurgence to that song I don't think it ever needed any help because it's almost like people are born knowing it it's almost like a hereditary thing you hear the beginning of Dancing Queen do 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 whatever and suddenly screams and people run onto the floor and start dancing and I'm not talking about people that were was it this was like 99 let's say 2000 so 10 years before that would be what 1990 1980 90, so yeah people that weren't even alive when the song was released were jumping onto the dance floor well they weren't always jumping some people just walked onto the dance floor and it wasn't like a really low dance floor people had to jump down from a balcony or anything like that that would be weird I suppose unless it was a swimming pool and then all the water just got you know drained out and then you'd jump in there used to be a place near where uh, the comedy club that I used to go to and it was called Aqua the Aquarium yeah Ac the Aquarium I could never get my head around this I never went and I probably would have really liked it but I never went I just not being a, a fan of being around drunk people I'm not drunk men really I don't drunk women I, I quite like but when I was younger but drunk men just never really enjoyed it and I'm not really drunk anybody I like sober people <laughs> sometimes anyway I didn't go but this was a place where there was a pool I think there's more than one swimming pool and drunk people would get in there And I just couldn't get my head around it because I always remember the adverts on television when I was very young saying, if you just eaten, you need to leave it a while before you go swimming. You shouldn't go swimming on a full stomach. And I was thinking, well, if someone's drinking and they're drunk, that's still a full stomach, even if it's not food. And I think 
if if you're drunk, if you're not able to drive a car, you shouldn't be able to go swimming. You know, you kind of just, I suppose I've got this little self um, health and safety thing. It's always in my head. Health and safety. Be careful, everybody. Be careful. Stop having fun. Be careful. But that's just me. I never went. But, uh, I might have really enjoyed it. I just... Just really ever got drunk in public. Didn't... I don't know why. Just... I suppose I spent quite a long... A lot of time around drunk people. Like worked in bars and pubs and... Yeah, just... Hmm, you know... Yeah, not not really. I really found it that. I don't know, even when I did gigs, and I'd have, sometimes I'd have people come and see me, you know, come talk to me afterwards. And there'd be a man, sometimes, quite often it was men, and they'd be talking to me, and they'd be drunk, and I was like, Oh, what a shame! I'm gonna have to have to listen to him talking, because you can't do. I can't do what I normally do, where I just talk and talk and talk. Drunk people don't let you do that, because they want to talk. So I guess I'm kind of like a sober drunk. Wow, I never thought about that. I'm like a a sober drunk person. I want to dominate the conversation. But actually, I'm sober. Now that's a weird one. Anyway, I should... uh, I should talk about birds, shouldn't I? Here's me talking about ABBA and the Bee Gees and Adam and the Ants and... uh, I'll tell you one of my favourite songs. <laughs> Two of my favourite songs. Actually, three of my favourite songs. At that time. Andre's just come in. He was asleep for ages. And he's just wandering around. No, he's gone to sleep in the corner now. Spice up my is it Spice Up My Life or Spice Up My Life, yeah, by the Spice Girls. I really like that song. It's really just like the the way it was put together. Such a good song. And then there was there was um Girls Aloud. I forget what it was called, but it was Admittedly, this wasn't while I was doing a disco, but it's so good. This girl's allowed hadn't existed at that point. And it was the best, for me, the best song they produced, but one of the best songs, for, you know, of the year. It was such a good song. And they performed it on The X Factor. Can you hear Andre in the background? It's in the kitchen. Playing with the plastic bags. I've just seen him run past me. Basically, he had his girlfriend in his mouth, which is my old slipper. So he's either he's going to go into the bedroom and be busy for the next hour, or he's going to come in here, no pun intended, and make noise in here hopefully he'll stay in the bedroom oh incidentally I just made a a new deep sleep whisper hypnosis recording and Andre was actually on the bed while I was doing it and he was asleep all the way through so that was good he just 
started to wake up as I came to finish. So, you know, because sometimes it'll just walk over the recorder or just start climbing all over me and stuff, which is nice, but I'm kind of like trying to say to him that I'm working. Come back later on, please. So, yeah. What's the other song? Oh, there's another song I really liked. outside I think it was a cat or cats it wasn't Andre I know all of his sounds all the sounds that he makes well I wonder what it was Bee Gees did a song and I think it was for who the for whom the bell tolls. It might be that one, but it's another one that's really, really good. And I think so I had the Bee Gees album when I was about nine, ten, the best of the Bee Gees. And then here I am. 29 or 30 and they're still producing songs and this is when they were all still around all three of them and I used to love the the way is it Barry Beardy Barry would he had a different tone to his voice but then his brother I think it's Robin who's I was going to say the slim one, but they're all they're all very slim, aren't they? But he would be the one with the glasses, not the one with the hat. That always had a hat. And because one of them, I think, married Lulu. I think it was the one with a hat. So it was Barry, Robin, and. I don't know, and it's called Sam, Sammy. I don't know, I forget his name. But they all had some really different tone to their voices. And I like the songs where they sing individually as such a compliment to each other. They just even I mean you think in the late nineties they must have been about 90 themselves and it's like wow just really enjoyed listening to them I just yeah I'm a big fan of the old bee bee geese so this is the first bird it's called the grey heron and How it works is, not how it works, but apparently it stands, it's quite got very long legs and it stands very still in the water. It's got a very long orange beak and it looks like it's got a ponytail, which is uh, probably quite an unusual feature for a bird. So I wonder, you know, when people say it's a red herring, when they're saying that it's uh, like a fake, um, like a fake clue, or it's a false statement, or, you know, it's uh, trying to distract you from what is real. Why is that called a red herring? What have people got against herons? Red heron, red heron. But 
that's a thing. It's spelled H-E-R-O-N. That's a heron, not a herring. Herring would be H-E-H-E-R-I-N, surely. Anyway, apparently they stand in the river in the shallow bits and then they peck into the water to feed and it says that the voice has got a loud harsh squawking croaking sound and they normally nest in large treetops. Oh, with others as well. And they lay four to five eggs at a time between January and May. Hmm. So I wonder what a red heron is. That's a grey heron. It says they've got similar, similar species is a purple heron. Hmm. So the next one <sighs> the next one is a sparrow hawk. Oh, let me tell you about it might not be in here. Let's have a look. Might there's a bird. It was part of my Just going through it. I think one of my favourite birds is the robin. I don't know what it is about the robin. I think it might be because I'm just looking at it now. I'm well, not looking, it's not an actual robin, it's a picture. It's not even a photograph, I don't think. Oh, no, it is. I think it's it's a little bit like pigeons. You know, you look at them and think, how on earth do they fly? They're so, look at that belly. How can you fly with such a big belly? And I just think they're so cute. It's a little round. And I suppose I can't, I, yeah, I associate robins with Christmas because of like Christmas cards and a robin uh, surrounded by snow and stuff. But of course, robins are around all, all the year. According to this, well, we already know it's round bodied, slim tailed doesn't have a ponytail but this is giving it a, a, a personality trait it's saying that it's shy well it's a bit presumptuous isn't it can't be that shy otherwise they wouldn't reproduce would they there's got to be some confident robins out there being able to sort of chat up the, the females and or to chat up the males if they were all shy there'd be none uh, there'd be no hanky panky at all would there and they would never see another robin ever in the world ever again so to say that they're shy does seem a little bit like a generalisation so According to this, it's, it's adapted for following animals such as wild boar and taking small animals from the earth, I suppose like worms. So we don't have wild boar, not in my town anyway. It says here in the UK, it's adapted by following gardeners instead and to become very tame.
So it nests. Ah, look, it says, don't nest the leaves and grass in the bank of a bush. So they don't, they don't nest in trees. And they have four to six eggs between April and August. And it says two broods. I don't know what that means. Similar species, they've got nightingale, a red start, and a dunnock. I've heard of a nightingale, but none of the others. Beautiful little birds. I'm really a big fan of robins. I think it's the colouring. I think it's just the and the little, the little, and they stand out because I'm, I'm not being prejudiced. But some of these look very similar. They all look the same to me, like the wren. The Dunnock, the Field Fair, the Missile Thrust, the Song Thrust, the Red Wing. Well, it's got a bit of red in it, but it's sort of still grey, you know, very grey, like brown. The Black Cap, the Chiff Chaff. Now, that's a brilliant name. Chiff Chaff. If I ever have a kid, I'm going to call him Chiff Chaff. Chiff Chaff. Imagine, what's your name? Chiff Chaff Newland. Brilliant. I suppose they want to just call him Chiff for sure. By sight, the chiff chaff is almost impossible to distinguish from the willow warbler. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that sentence. Um, although it is slightly plumper, and there's a habit of dipping its tail downward. So basically, it's very similar to another bird. But you can tell it's different because it dips its tail differently. However, when it sings, it betrays its identity by, repeat, <laughs> by repeating its name over and over again. Understand that? Does it actually say chiff chaff? It does apparently. According to this, it says chip chap, chip chap, chip chop chip. So that's the noise it makes. Chip chap, chip chap. How brilliant! Now this is a cute one. It's got big eyes. It's pretty. It's a pretty bird. And it looks like a girl. And that's... I don't know why. It's just pretty. Some of the birds, it's not, you know, not doing it for me. But this one is little. It's cute. Very beautiful. Beautiful face. Very pretty, literally, you should have a look. Chiff chaff, beautiful little thing. And there's another one here which is very strange. Never, never seen one like this before. It's called a gold crest. And apparently, it's Europe's smallest bird. So maybe that it's not in the United Kingdom of England. I don't know. It's little, it's very little. It doesn't say how little it is, but it's proper little. Wow, it's 
So it says nesting, cup of cobwebs and moss slung from a branch. It has seven to eight eggs, April to July. Similar species to the gold crest are fire crest, willow, war <laughs> willow warbler and a chiff chaff. So it's they're kind of similar birds. It's very it's got literally round. It's the top of his head looks like another stomach. And it looks like it's actually I don't know used its own poo to to wash its hair because this yellow yellow stripe down the front of its head either that or it's it almost like it's saying you can park here on the road kind of so there's a long tailed tit so that's this one's so cute and it does have a long tail the tail is probably longer than its body but it's cute this little face like the gold crest bless it it's it's not going to win a beauty contest no offence it's I can't I kind of like think I'm turning into a gold crest not gradually but the long tail tit so what a beautiful little face really and it's quite big as well I mean, it's not big but it's got a very round body so apparently they make they like hang around with each other and they have parties together in the summer has 8 to 12 eggs in April and June between April and June wow I only want to talk about the cute ones now I thought that all tits were pretty much the same yeah I know that all tits are different but I figured they kind of have fairly similar uh, I don't know shapes or attributes but the long tail tit is completely different from the marsh tit which is very slim and long so this tit's quite long and yeah quite long uh, tail quite a long tail but not long long it's got, yeah, it's apparently it's quite distinctable by its pit chew call. So the song is like a rippling chip, 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 like that. But then the coal tip is, it's almost like the marsh tip is turning into the great tit via the cold tit and the blue tit very strange like the cold tit is fairly dark quite plumpy apparently lives in conifer trees and it's very little it's very very f doesn't weigh much apparently Apparently it's active and fearless. And apparently the tits get together. The, 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 the tit family seem to get on quite well with each other. So it's not just... Um, I suppose they're kind of cousins of each other. I mean, I get on with my cousins. 
in the past. So yeah, so they seem to hang out with each other. So the tits hang out together. The blue tit, I would argue, is the most famous tit out of all of them. The reason I remember the blue tit is because we used to have a long time ago when I was younger a lot happened when I was younger there we used to have milk bottles like they were made of glass and this person uh, we used to call them milkmen of course that would be a wouldn't be able to say the word men or man after that but that's at the time it seemed to be predominantly uh, male dominated occupation um, but I've not done a consensus of all the different people that had that particular job at that time but anyway we had a man that delivered so he um, was the milkman and would come down well I didn't although I, I might have done I think sometimes I might have been sent out to collect the milk from the doorstop or the, the you know the is it doorstop the step on the door the front door and would have this little rack um, it'd be like a white rack with I think probably four four square holes which you could put the milk bottles in so the empties would be put out at night and then the milkman would come and take the empties and put the new ones in and you'd see him carrying the empties in his fingers and he'd, sometimes you'd have five it actually looked like he had really big fingers made of glass so the blue tits used to eat the cream at the top of the, the milk so they'd peck through the tin foil and they'd uh, nibble at the cream and drink it so that's how I remember the blue tits really because they'd uh, yeah they basically sometimes it would, you know, it was supposed to be a rack of milk, but it ended up being a rack of tits. It's, it's weird. Like they'd, and I don't, I don't, even at the time, I thought, is this hygienic? Should it really be drinking this afterwards? But we did, so it seemed to be okay. But I had this memory of them being really cute. And there is a picture, and this is the one that I'm thinking of. It's the less blue, because it's got more of a rounded head. The yellow, and the, so there's different blue tits. The one here has got quite a, almost like a Mohican. It's like a black and white face. But the, the other one, which has got a less blue one. Yeah, that's the one I think of. Then you've got the great tip. So, I never realised it was great tit. I thought it was grey tit, as in the colour. So everyone likes a great tit. These are probably one of the most popular birds, I think. I mean, blue tits, grey tits, it's a different kind of bird, it just looks different. It's slim, it looks taller, longer tail, um, it's got some blue on its wing, in fact from the looks of it the whole of the wing might be blue when it's spread. And the great tit is one of the most familiar garden woodland birds in the UK. So it's probably one of the most uh, 
seen birds. So the great, yeah, the great tit of Great Britain. So I'm looking at what other birds there are. But I don't think we should talk about all of them because we're getting to the end of the, the session. There's quite a few. There's the Rook, there's the Starling, the Brambling, the Chaffinch, the Goldfinch. Oh, that's a, that's a beautiful colouring. Brambling's quite cute as well. Oh, I almost wish I was a bird. Bullfinch. Uh, Greenfinch. Uh, maybe. It's quite nice. It's quite a few. I don't know which ones I like the most. I think chaffinches are quite nice. Great Spotted Woodpecker. That's quite cute as well. I do like doves. But Robin, I think the Robin's my favourite. Anyway. I'm going to bring this to an end. Thank you for listening and speak to you next time. And remember to be kind to yourself. What's the love?